Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us at the Frist Centre for Autism and Innovation April's webinar. I am the Frist Centre Project Coordinator, Jessica Shonat Stasek, and I'm going to be having a conversation today with Ed Thompson, author of the new book, A Hidden Force, Unlocking the Potential of Neurodiversity at Work. Let me just stop sharing this so we can see us. There we go. Okay, so first a couple of housekeeping notes. This is a webinar, so if you have any questions, please pop them in the Q&A or the chat, and I will work them in as we go. Um, and as with all our webinars, this will be recorded and available on the Frist Centre YouTube, um, but there'll be no identifying information for anyone who's uh, attending, so don't, that, don't worry about that. Um, I'd like to start by introducing our speaker this morning, Ed Thompson. Ed is the founder and CEO of Optimize, the leading neuro inclusion training company, whose mission is to help organizations embrace and leverage every type of thinker. He was born and raised in London, go London. Uh, and educated at the University of Oxford. Ed founded Optimize in 2016, recognizing the urgent need for greater understanding and appreciation of neurodiversity within the working world. His role with Optimize has afforded him unique insights and connections with pioneers in the neurodiversity at work field across the world. And he is now a frequent speaker on the topic. Uh, these, they have been featured in outlets like LinkedIn, the BBC, People Management Magazine, HR.com and the Financial Times. And his new book discusses neurodiversity at work, why it matters, and how to support people in this unique talent pool. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, Ed, I loved your book. Thank you. Um, so, let's just start, though, with talking a bit about you um, as the author. So, at least a bit more in-depth than the blurb I definitely stole from your website. So, what inspired you to write this book, and to a greater extent, like began your your journey into like neurodiversity and starting up to mice? Yeah, and thank you for having me, Jess. And it's great to to be here. And uh, we've been uh, fans of the Frist Centre for, uh, for Autism and Innovation, and uh, uh, been happy to 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 work together in some different capacities for some time. So, really pleased to to be here. I've been on a journey with this topic, uh, which started, of course, like many people with around 10 years ago, never having heard the term neurodiversity. Uh, it was rather to my surprise that I got involved in people and diversity issues uh, on the leadership team of a tech company in London, looking at ways to help my boss, who was the CEO, address his big priorities. And his big priorities, like those of many CEOs these days, were around people. How do we hire the best people? How do we keep people around? How do we innovate? And so on. So got involved in, in strategic diversity initiatives to, to meet those goals. And through that, started talking with some neurodivergent family members. And they said, I don't know if you've seen what's happening in the neurodiversity at work area and this was absolutely embryonic in 2015 or so but you might want to, to look at that because it's pretty similar to the stuff you've been doing um, in London and as I found out about this space and this was maybe you know two companies building neurodiversity at work programs at this point um, I had a series of aha sort of wow realizations uh, realizing how many people are neurodivergent realizing how much talent finds itself marginalized because organizations don't understand neurodiversity, don't know anything about it. Uh, that was the genesis to start building educational resources to change that. Uh, realizations over time that, look, neurodiversity is actually all of us in the sense that we all have a different brain. And so actually, if we're not paying attention to that in business, gosh, what could happen if we if we started to change that? Probably some, some pretty good stuff. Um, Seeing the reaction as well to the topic as it grew, being part of early conferences, seeing the reaction to the training that we built, and we see neurodivergent people who are, um, you know, within our, our learner groups, really often responding to neuroinclusion training quite emotionally, saying, you know, I'm so pleased that you're doing this. This has just transformed my experience. But also seeing the impact and feedback from the cynics you know a manager who didn't know anything about neurodiversity 20 minutes before saying I was a cynic I didn't know what this had to do with me but this is the most profound thing I've heard in leadership in 
in 20 years. So you put all that together in this journey, you know, this was really a book that sort of tumbled out of me. I knew I had to write. There was so much stuff there that I wanted to, to share with the world. Um, I realized that, you know, if you're training people in health and safety or training them in anti-bribery, you know, you're probably not seeing that sort of <laughs> emotional response. And, and I thought this is really quite a special thing. It's quite a special moment in time. Uh, we've learned a ton from the work that we've done. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to share that. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I really enjoyed how um, I thought it was really interesting how you, you mentioned in the book about how this kind of this neurodiversity at work paradigm started happening at the same time as we were like having a, a, a need for talent um, generally in in the um, in the kind of, um, you know, hiring space. Um, and could you speak to that a bit? Because I think that is that's a really interesting that those two things kind of happened to converge. Um, and I think it worked out, I mean, it worked out well, didn't it? <laughs> um, and it wasn't just, I mean, obviously it wasn't just neurodiverse folk, but it was the disability community generally who, you know, had this growth of employment during that time. Um, do you think we hopefully will see this continue to grow? Well, I look at that a couple of different ways. I, back to my point earlier, look, every team, every organization is neurodiverse in the sense that everybody has a different brain. And so any aspect of talent management is going to be improved and any talent related priority addressed by paying attention to that in a way that we haven't done before. Now, you could talk about belonging and well-being and helping people stick around. You could talk about individual productivity. You could talk about team collaboration. Uh, of course, you can also talk about hiring. And I think what happened to your, to your point to really be the spark for this whole thing was that you had this growing societal awareness, I think, of neurodiversity, a term you know, first coined only in the 90s. And bear in mind, diversity and inclusion goes back to the 60s. So you had you know, decades of diversity and inclusion. Nobody's talking about neurodiversity, but that's slowly changing, right? And you had that start to change at social media. You had neurodivergent celebrities talking about their neurodivergence. You had growing uh, prevalence data of how many people may be neurodivergent. I think that, to your point, converged in about the mid 2010s with a period of time where companies were really talent hungry. And particularly just with the, 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 the growth of technology, to some extent, every organization becoming a tech company, right? And it, and it wasn't just tech companies, it was banks. And you don't think of a bank as a tech company, but banks have these enormous teams of developers and everybody's kind of looking for the same talent. And I think there was that sort of convergence where folks were looking for talent and there was this kind of cultural correlation, particularly with autistic people as programmers. Now we know from the research we've done that there are many autistic people who, who don't have that inclination or, or, or those interests, but some do. But really that was what came together to, to be the spark. Now what's happened since, which I think is great, is that of course that spark has then lit this far bigger fire, if you like, and that's become far more nuanced. And of course you have autistic people at big tech companies saying, hey, I'm already here and I'm nothing to do with web development. And, you know, I'm really good at this thing. And, you know, maybe we can work together to, to help make the company more, more inclusive. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's true, isn't it? That with, um, I think there's also this growing understanding of the strength-based paradigm of autism or neurodiversity generally and how lots of you, oh, there's Kayvon, how exciting. We have a special speaker adding himself to the chat. And he's coming. So um, I did particularly enjoy when I was when I was reading the book, you really choose to um, add a lot of neurodivergent voices, you know, as opposed to writing, you know, like a manual for people to use to employ or recruit or retain neurodivergent folk, you really chose to, well, I think it seems like you chose to use lots of anecdotes and anecdotes and stories from the neurodiverse community. So um, why did you think that was a better approach? Or did you think that was a better approach? Why did you choose to do that? 
<laughs> I, I did. Uh, it was it was very deliberate. That came from the approach we've taken at Optimize to building training curricula in this space. And of course, when we started and we realized, look, organizations don't know anything about this and we want to change it. Uh, there wasn't a ton uh, that we could immediately draw on. So we started building a model where we could start building that curricula with some uh, sort of solid roots. And we felt like lived experience was key to that. And so a big pillar has been the focus groups that we've run with neurodivergent professionals around the world. Everyone from 19 year old job seekers to a 60 year old CEO who said, look, I got to the top, but it took me 20 years longer than it should have done. And I think we've aggregated that. And of course, to some extent, you learn that everybody is different. And you learn quickly how every stereotype is basically nonsense, right? Because everybody bucks yeah. the stereotype in their own way. Um, but of course, to some extent, you start seeing patterns in terms of barriers um, and you start mm -hmm. sometimes learning solutions that people have found that I think others could, could follow. So for me with the book, it was a natural progression to, to do the same thing. Uh, and I also think there's there's value, if you like, in the in the in those aggregated experiences. And I wanted to write a book that was not the personal memoir type of which there are some fantastic contributions in this field, but one that from my, I think, privileged position could be something that captured all sorts of voices and provided that slightly more layered uh, view. I, I think that's great because obviously that like you said there's just not every no one story is the same and there are you know so many trends that get every new they say you know you meet one autistic person you've met one autistic person right like everyone's story is different um so we do have some questions popping up in the q a which i need to put my glasses on for let me, <laughs> let me just while, while you're looking at those let me just add one more thing which is actually i was finding yeah. that uh, these interviews sometimes would be, you know, wonderfully emblematic of, uh, you know, either a, um, you know, a, 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 a strength or maybe a barrier that we'd recognise and, and come across. There was a an interview I did quite late in the day, but did manage to get it get in the book uh, with a gentleman who's in his fifties and has had real challenges maintaining employment because of uninclusive, uh, you know, job uh, hiring processes. And I think that was just, uh, you know, I could use his voice and his experiences to make, I think, a really important point that, you know, we're not just talking about graduates here. We're not just talking about 20 year olds. And actually, if we truly want to be neuro inclusive. We have to look at the intersectionality into other groups. And in fact, oh, age, yeah. age is one of those, you know, uh, as well, uh, and not punish somebody mm. who um, who's had a, a patchier resume. Uh, for reasons totally out of their control. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I think that's very key right now as well with lots of, I feel like there's lots of people in, in my age group and like the kind of early 30s age group who are only just getting diagnosed and who are, you know, now understanding maybe some of their like patchy job history or some of what look, their CV looks like and like being able to even just themselves understand and take that forward um we do so yeah we have Kayvon appeared hi Kayvon so Kayvon is our uh the director of the Frist Center of Autism and Innovation and was quoted in the book along with Dave Cordell um would you like to say a little anything Kayvon about the book we're just having a chat about um about Ed and his book yeah well but uh, do not let me take any of the the time or the thunder here we're really this is the purpose of this webinar right is to really put a a spotlight on this important book and, and Ed's important work. Um, very, very proud at the First Center for Autism and Innovation to, um, to, to be a partner with Ed and with Optimize. And uh, just congratulations, Ed, on this book. It's an important contribution. And um, I'll just say that and let, let others ask questions and we'll benefit from Ed's wisdom today. Thank you, Kayvon. Awesome. So you do, Kayvon, you are appearing like on our screen as like a panelist. So I can, you know, if you have anything you want to say, like, feel free to chime in, um, because we do, I have got some questions here that kind of bridge from neurodiversity at work into the kind of uh, higher education space. Um, so feel free to chime in at any time. Um, I was going to ask, well, so we have some questions in the chat, which I will prioritize over the questions I have written. Um, there's one here that says, uh, there seems to be a lot of lip service from companies about hiring. 
However, the implementation is to be uh, is to seems kind of uneven. What are the real business drivers that will motivate employers to mainstream neurodiversity employment? Yeah, that's that's a really good uh, that's a really good question. Again, I think neuro inclusion done right can address all aspects of talent management. And we know CEO priorities these days are essentially HR priorities. You look at the uh, um, you know, annual reports of corporate America, what are CEOs talking about? They're talking about diversity, they're talking about access to talent, they're talking about keeping talent around, they're talking about innovation. I mean, these are all critical uh, priorities. They're not, I don't think any of that is lip service. I think. I think that the the issue is tying neuroinclusion to those goals in in their mind, and I think if that's not truly tied together, then that's where you get the what what appears to be the the lip service uh, initiative, the, the the box check, uh, and so on. I I do think the within that the issue of folks leaving employment is huge, and even with the kind of wobbles with the economy at the moment you've still got I think one in three or so corporate employees voluntarily leaving every year I think if we can all make the case around uh, well-being and belonging to say that if we pay attention to all of our different thinkers we already have that we can start to address that and we see the work of our customers we see the work of neurodiversity enterprise resource groups where you know if that they're almost pulling people back from the exit door. Like somebody wants to leave because they don't get on with their manager, they don't feel understood and so on. And whether it's training or whether it's support from an enterprise resource group can, can change their mind. I think, I think that's a really, you know, a really strong driver. But there is education that needs to happen, again, to kind of join the dots. I think the more CEOs who realize uh, that, again, they lead neurodiverse organizations, the more CEOs who realize this isn't just about hiring because you already have all sorts of different thinkers in your organization, the more CEOs who realize the impact of neuroinclusion and what it can bring, you know, and I hope that that's a contribution the book can make. You now, I think we'll hopefully grade away from the box check and more towards the corporate strategy. Yeah, that's that's. A really that was a really good question and answer um you do i this kind of was something i was going to ask because you do mention in the book about how we have all these neurodiversity hiring initiatives um but at the time when they were being implemented or when they started being implemented that there were the workers already when you're a divergent within those companies saying oh but like i i'm here <laughs> um and so i would ask obviously you've spoken to a lot of different companies and a lot of different kind of resource providers um, have you seen anything particularly innovative in terms of retention for already neurodiverse folk or folk coming in who are neurodiverse within those companies? Well, I think it's it's sort of it's almost boringly simple to me, I, and I think it's around culture and awareness. And again, look, there was some data in the UK a couple of years ago that said nine in ten. So 90% of neurodivergent employees don't typically disclose. And with all of the focus groups that we've done where a lot of people talk to us about the stress and the exhaustion of masking, clearly that's not a good thing in terms of productivity or in terms of wanting to stick around, right? If I'm, if I'm turning right. up every day and I, and I can't be myself, um, that's a problem. We've, we've even seen people like my friend, the uh, ADHD community builder, Trina Haynes, be in the really, I mean, I think she would agree, ridiculous situation of having 50,000 followers on Twitter uh, where she's talking about being an ADHD and the challenges and the, and the benefits and so on, and yet not talking to her own manager about it because, you know, she felt uncomfortable, right, at the same time. So when we do uh, surveys of learners, we find 60% plus people still put their hand up and say, I don't know much about neurodiversity, never heard the word, et cetera, et cetera. I think those of us in the field can forget that that's the reality. And so I think it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a magic bullet, but it's just changing that, right? And, and changing the team that a neurodivergent person finds themselves in 
from one where nobody is paying attention to this, from one where people recognize that they were in a neurodiverse environment. They have their own thinking style as well, whatever their neuro identity, they're bringing that to their work, but so is everybody else. You know, that pivot is just so profound and that does require a little bit of education. Um, but I think, you know, from that point, good things happen. And you see people like, uh, again, another friend of mine who's at Salesforce in their ERG, we've done a lot of work with them saying, you know, I, I never want to go to another, another company that isn't doing this because he's experienced company A and company B. He's experienced the company where all of these interactions are taking place every day between people with different brains and nobody's paying attention to that. And everything's defaulting towards the sort of unsaid preferences of the majority. And he's experienced an organization and teams where people can surface things like their communication preferences, their problem solving preferences and so on. There's a sensitivity to this and he's seen the difference. I think that's the solution. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, excuse me, really throaty today. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. And because you do, you talk about kind of accommodations in the book and how you said just there, you think it's kind of boring and simple um, in terms of how we recruit and retain. And uh, But do you think, uh, obviously in the Frist Centre, we, we're we kind of on the, um, we're kind of at this, this uh, area between kind of higher education and workforce development do you think these things that you're seeing at companies in terms of recruitment and retention can uh kind of be some of the some of the um kind of things that are going on can you do you think they can be transferred into higher education do you think they would be useful in the, that setting as well i think so absolutely because if you you look at the uh, you look at the strengths neurodivergent people can bring, you look at the barriers that they face, I don't think there's any limit to that in terms of the type of work or the type of industry. Uh, and so whether it's, uh, you know, how do you attract talent, uh, whether it's uh, how does a, a leader, now this could be, a, you know, a head of department or it could be a manager, you know, how do they recognise and embrace the fact that they're, colleagues think in different ways. I think it's all applicable. Awesome, awesome. Um, so you fill your book with so many anecdotes. This is kind of moving away a bit, I'm just very curious. You fill your book with so many wonderful anecdotes and stories. Um, so this might be a bit of a cheeky question, but was there anyone who you interviewed who you found to be kind of you just particularly inspiring? Or did you think anyone's stories were particularly amazing? I mean, everyone's story is amazing, but was there anyone you spoke to who really made you go, wow? Well, I think you, <laughs> it's like a teacher, you know, you, you don't want to have favorites, but I mean, of course I should say Kayvon and Dave because uh, Kayvon is here. <laughs> um, but, but I mean, I think there, there were, and, and actually there, you know, there were a couple, um, there were a few, I think there was like three or four that I that I really made into uh, longer segments, and and rather you know rather than just a, a, a few quotes. And actually, Dave was one of those. So there's a whole chapter that kind of starts with Dave's story, and I found that so interesting. And I think I what I enjoyed about that was how uh, analytical Dave is about his own experience, right? And so you have this kind of like wonderfully dual level story where you have the kind of maybe slightly naive Dave in his younger days facing these barriers right and then you have the kind of super well-informed analytic Dave of today who's passionate about changing this kind of like analyzing you know this this person's experience and of course it's all you know it's all his so I enjoyed that one um and then just look in terms of I'm a big believer in championing neurodivergent strengths. I, I don't tend to talk about superpowers. I do think that's a little trite, but I do think the balance has been wildly towards challenges over strengths. And I think that's perpetuated by the medical model, of course, and what it takes to get a diagnosis. You don't get a diagnosis because you're brilliant at being creative. You get a diagnosis because you can't do X, Y, or, 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 or Z. Uh, and there's a guy, uh, Sean Fry, who I interviewed and was, I thought, a fantastic case of just this incredible mind. Now, look, he's a bit of a genius. Not everybody else is. 
but I loved hearing his story. And, you know, this is somebody who by his own admission hates going to a bank because it just doesn't know how it works. And yet he's coming up with patterns and, you know, you name it. And it was just his, his energy and his brain. I just thought, wow, this is just fantastic. Yeah, I, I enjoyed reading his story where you say he, you know, has sold these companies for millions, but doesn't like going to a bank. And I had this image of him having a room just full of cash. <laughs> and I'm not sure how you would like deal with that. Um, but yeah, there was such, there were such amazing stories and anecdotes in there, which I think was such a good way to to kind of highlight highlight all the different um, experiences of neurodivergent folk. Because you also have a I can't remember who it was, but you do talk to someone who ends up working in the in the finance field, which is obviously completely the opposite to someone who doesn't want to work in a bank at all. Um, and as you said, there are a lot of people who buck the trend. I, I thought it was specific, uh, particularly interesting when you uh, talk to people who. Uh, find that they have really good kind of um, uh, conversational skills and are able to do sales really well and things like that, which is something that you don't often associate with neurodiversity. Um, do you think that's because we we do have this um, kind of societal idea of what it means to be neurodiverse or what it means to be autistic? Um, do you think it is just a lack of education and we need to kind of talk to companies more about what they can expect or what they not necessarily expect but what they should be looking for in that way well i yeah i think you know companies exist within the societal context you know we can sort of divorce the two but obviously they're populated by people from these societies and at the moment they're populated by people from societies with a low level of neurodiversity education and consequently knowledge you know that's the reality so uh, you know, a lot of these stereotypes are real and in the workplace, they raise their ugly head. And we hear uh, folks in our focus group say, you know, I disclose as autistic and somebody said, gosh, I'm so sorry. I know that, you know, hurts your life expectancy. Right. Nonsense. I don't know where they got that from. Um, we hear particularly, you know, autistic women, for example, say nobody believes that they could possibly be autistic because they're socially polished and they're married and so on. Um, you know, people didn't don't believe that a, an adult could be an ADHD. -er. So unfortunately, and I wish we were past this, but unfortunately, these things remain. And, you know, I, I, I do think uh, if we're looking to be a successful organization, we have to accept the fact that we've inherited or we've acquired talent that has had all sorts of good preparation to be working in our neurodiverse environment. But a crucial piece they're missing is recognizing the fact that, look, people are an organization's most expensive asset. The one tool we're all using every day is our brain. And, and, and again, people are just missing that. And unfortunately, if, we, if it's missing, then you know, the stereotypes run, run rife. Yeah, and you do talk in the book about um, how so you were just saying about retention and about people kind of, you know, leaving the workforce. And you do talk in the book about how with these programs in place, you see a much higher increase of retention amongst um, neurodiverse individuals. Um, why do you think that is? Well, the, the, the data on, on that is um, is a little patchy, as it as it often is with this with this field, I think. Uh, it really kind of comes from a, from a couple of different places. So hiring programs where there's a always kind of like the cohort based hiring programs. Um, I think to some extent, you know, those are uh, attracting and hiring uh, folks who may themselves have experienced challenges getting employed before. I know Microsoft found that about half of the people they hired on their program had previously applied and not got in. And I think, you know, sadly, there's probably a, a sense of here's a rare opportunity and here's an, and here's an organization that is actually, uh, you know, has taken steps to, to, to recruit and understand and, and, and support somebody like me and a sense that that's quite rare. And so I think that's where you see uh, really strong retention of, of talent in some of those programs, if you like, some, for some good reasons. And, and someone I interviewed in, in my book as well from Microsoft was talking about what a great experience he'd had there and how that stood out. But in a sense, it's the negative as well that I think there's a feeling like this is the, you know, this is the niche and not, and not the wider reality. Uh, we have slightly less data on 
what this does for broader retention and belonging, although at Optimize that's something we're working on. But again, we have many uh, instances of stories of people remaining at an organization because of its efforts to promote neuro inclusion. Yeah, so like you said, that's good and bad. It's the it's the good of, uh, oh, well, this place is awesome and I really like working here, but then there's the side of, oh, but is this a unique experience? Like maybe there's a fear that if they did change jobs, it wouldn't be as good or it wouldn't have that same kind of level of inclusion. Um, I could see yeah. that, for sure. And that's, and that's yeah. you know, the, 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 the dynamics of that, of course, change over time, right? So we have a, let's take, we have an industry and nobody's doing this. And then we have a pioneer or two and most of the rest of the industry don't even know that what they're doing but the people in the organization think gosh this actually this is great and you know i'm probably better off over here than i would be jumping ships you start maybe seeing that retention dynamic coming i think where it's going to be interesting is when this becomes even more the norm and you really start being the luddite if you're not paying attention to neuro inclusion and of, and to some extent i would have thought broader issues of diversity and inclusion and I think you look at, again, the fact that uh, people are leaving companies voluntarily so frequently and this kind of changing uh, relationship and power dynamic between talent and organizations. You know, to me, that's untenable. You know, And I'm a CEO, I'm a CEO of a very small company. If I was a CEO of a much larger company, I would be obsessing over how do we get great people to come, not just to come here, but to stay. Yeah, absolutely. Cause um onboarding is very expensive right and finding talent's expensive and you want to keep good talent when you find it yeah yep. um as you mentioned your as you mentioned your company would you be able to tell us a little bit about optimize and also how you've seen the landscape change um because as you in your book you obviously go through this pros you talk about uh for people who haven't read it this process from not having any real neurodiversity inclusion in companies and then how that increases over time and you kind of go through it chronologically um so how have you seen that change in the course of your time yeah great great question and I, I i talk about this a little bit in the in the book well again our mission was to help organizations embrace every type of thinker and that was our message that was our mission from the beginning now to some extent at the beginning and i talk about 2016 2017 2018 the only game in town here was the autism hiring program to some extent and so of course we provided training around these programs while uh, certainly having the wish ourselves and the belief that this needed to go beyond and often finding with our customers, surprise, surprise, you know, everybody needs this. Everybody is benefiting from it and probably everybody needs this. And so you start seeing a journey and an interesting take example of, say, an IBM or a Salesforce where they started with a hiring program. They started seeing more people uh, self-disclose across the organization. And then there was this kind of natural evolution to a broader training provision. So actually anybody who wanted support on this topic could get it. And ultimately now, you know, we're doing some work with Salesforce around, you know, hiring programs. And, you know, you, you start to evolve from the uh, kind of specific and local to the more proactive and, and the more global. And I think that's been one of the changes that, that we've seen. And we now have some big brands this year working with us. And you know, they're not saying we want to hire five autistic people in Tampa Bay. Of course, they, they would like to do that, but they're, they're generally saying we recognize that we need to become a neuroinclusive inclusive employer. And at some point we might wanna put our foot on the gas to hire more people. We wanna do that at a point where we feel like this is an environment that everybody can thrive, you know, and it's just a little bit of a shift of priorities. To me, you know, as a sort of tech person, that makes a ton of sense. You know, are you putting all your money in getting people in your app when actually it's a terrible experience? Or are you focusing on the experience and then saying, right, we actually feel like, you know, this is somewhere that, you know, that, that is doing a pretty good job of this. You know, let's step things up. And of course, in the 21st century, that's how people recruit a lot of the time. It's about 20% of hires come from employee recommendations, Glassdoor, and so on. So, you know, if you if you build this culture that people are attached to, I think people under undersell how important that is for recruitment as well. Yeah, especially with these big, especially with big tech firms, I feel like you see 
I've definitely been on Glassdoor and seen, oh, I'd quite like to work for that company because of the, the things that people are saying about their culture. Um, yeah. You talk a bit about in the book, so we talked about kind of the, the programs for hiring specifically neurodiverse individuals, but you also talk about how the, the kind of standard model of um, hiring, you know, the old school version of application, resume, interview, kind of doesn't really work necessarily for the neurodiverse population or doesn't work as it should. Um, but do you think this is a rising tide lifts all boats scenario? Like, do you think that if we were to improve our hiring practices across the board, that it wouldn't just help neurodiverse folk, but help kind of everyone? Yeah, absolutely. And look, I, I, I come at this, you know, to always to some extent come at this from the business perspective. And of course, look, I'm passionate about this myself. Um, you know, I, I had a traumatic brain injury myself, which gives me some traits that I think relate into neurodivergence, whether or not you, you classify that as a, as a neurodivergence or not. But I always think, you know, back to my experience leading a, a, a tech company from the sort of tech uh, perspective. And, you know, I want organizations to hire the best people. And I believe that that includes people who think in all sorts of different ways. And it's been probably the biggest realization of my experience leading up to my, that that's simply not happening at the moment, that organizations are simply not hiring the best people. Um, the story in the book, um, Jess, that you may have seen where um, an organization we were about to work with was hiring into that, into that specific team. And they'd had someone with a really strong resume apply the best resume, but they weren't going to hire him or they, they said they wouldn't have hired him in other circumstances because he was a little awkward at interview and so on. And because they'd uh, been looking at our training, they were like, oh, actually, what if we ask this question, this question? And, you know, consequently, they hired somebody who they admitted was the strongest candidate. Now, I look at that and I can say, great, look, our training works. But I can also look at that and be frightened by how easy it is not to hire you know the 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 best people. Um, I think if, as well, if you look at the the what I call the boulders in the road, the barriers that neurodivergent people face, they are many, and I think they are to some extent faced at times by neurotypicals with similar traits as well. Uh, it could be the over reliance on rapport in interviews. It could be confusing job descriptions. Uh, it could be confusing, time, stressful application forms, psychometric tests, and so on. So I'd like to think a lot of this, again, is a, is a universal uh, adjustment that, that benefits everybody. Now, just to finish on this point, I, I do think a lot of the, the, the problems when it comes to hiring come from a failure to just really stop and think about what do we actually need here? What are we actually looking for in terms of this role? What is absolutely essential? What is helpful, but not essential? That real clarity, not just, oh, Steve's leaving, we need another Steve. You know, that's probably not going to get us the best ultimate diversity of thought. So what I talk about in the book, and there's a, there's a, there's a book uh, called uh, The Who Method for Hiring, excellent book that some people may have seen in, in recruitment I'm sort of taking some messages from there you know I think if we slow down and we think what do we really want here and a lot of the time people do want diversity of thought and they do want different types of thinkers and they do want processes not just maintained but evolved and innovative um, we can hire in a way that really speaks to that need and we don't let things like rapport, right, or, you know, the apparently perfect resume, blind aperture. Right, right, absolutely. You can't, You just answered, like, the next three questions. So that was <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I We're talking for too long. And, um, no, 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 keep talking. It's excellent. Um, I love I love hearing about this book, and I, I really did enjoy reading it. Um, the... The, but it made me think what you've just said kind of made me think a little bit about how, especially when we think about neurodivergence, um, there is that moment kind of when we go from graduation, if we've done a college degree, into the workforce where there is this um, kind of drop off of 
kind of accommodations and help and support, the same as we see kind of going from the school system to the university system, which is obviously uh, something we focused on at the Frist Centre. So maybe Kayvon has some thoughts on this as well, but do you, you know, what do you think that things like kind of graduate programs or or um, partnerships with universities or kind of a more inclusive understanding within the university system can help in this way as well? Um, because I feel like there is a there is kind of a, a a spot when after graduation where it becomes kind of a it's a whole different ball game, right? It's a transition, and I know I personally, as a self advocate, like transitions are hard, change is hard. <laughs> so how do we how do we support our on your divergent colleagues and not just say, oh, good job, you've graduated, like, bye. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to hear Kayvon's view on that. Well, I, I think, <clears throat> well, I, I would go so far as to say that I think this is something that broadly, now there are exceptions, but broadly speaking, I think colleges and universities don't do very well. And that is specifically within the career you know, many colleges and universities have career centers or some office on campus or, you know, or, or uh, professional staff whose job it is to help prepare students for, for the world of work after graduation. And they're very good at what they do, uh, but it's unusual for those people to also have experience with neurodiversity, autism, the, you know, the unique, you know, challenges and opportunities around that, ways in which those students need to be sort of uniquely supported um, to, you know, to prepare resumes, to be ready for job interviews, to understand the expectations of, 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 of the workplace, um, uh, to, be, to be given tools, right? There are, there are, there are tools coming, coming along, um, including guides like Ed's book and um, the Mentor platform and a number of other things, right? And many times students aren't aware of those things because the support professionals at their colleges and universities aren't, aren't aware and aren't prepared for that. Um, so that was a broad statement, but I think that it, that it simply is the, the case. I'm interested, Ed, if I can kind of popcorn the question over to you now. D do you see ways in which your book could be could be useful to support professionals at colleges and universities whose job it is to help prepare students for uh, for the workplace? Could your book be helpful to those support professionals? Well, I, I think it can in this in to the to the extent that uh, again, neuro inclusion is just a, a fundamental human principle that's operating all the time. Look, the three of us still on this call and we all think differently and if we turned into a team in whatever field uh, the, the the more we could acknowledge that and embrace it the, the more successful we would we would be so I think having support uh, professionals who are familiar with uh, the terminology here who are familiar with some you know principles of how to start um, talking about um, you know how people might have different preferences or I mean I think they're going to be better support professionals that's kind of my point right um, what I don't think it's doing is necessarily uh, giving uh, giving them a, 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 an exact toolkit for you know what a neurodivergent person can do in terms of you know when to disclose and and stuff like that which is which is always incredibly difficult you know it's like saying as a, as a gay person you know when should I tell anybody it's 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 incredibly difficult to to, to advise on um, what I hope it does, and and if a if a support professional were to read the book and and to share some of it with um, the folks that they're supporting, what I hope it does as well is um, open their eyes to the fact that there are lots of organisations taking this seriously, and it sets expectations higher, so that somebody then joins an organisation and either becomes part of its neurodiversity or disability group. Um, or asks, look, why, you know, why isn't this happening here? So I think it can help, uh, but not necessarily, again, not necessarily giving people a playbook of, right, you know, here's how you do it as a 19 year old. Right, right. We, yeah, thanks guys. We, we have a question in the chat um, about retention. And I know we've, we've kind of talked a bit around this, but um, I'm going to read it out and we'll see if we have any, if you guys have anything you can, you can add to it. So, 
The hiring process is hard indeed, but to maintain the job is even harder. Perception of neurodiversity is one thing, but living it every day is very hard too, and also for neurotypicals. As neurodiverse myself, I've lived this firsthand. What do you think could be done to help this situation? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, we've talked about hiring. We've talked about sort of general culture, and I've kind of beaten the drum for that. Uh, and I think, and I think that's still where this starts. Uh, but let's talk about management. Let's talk about environments. You so we're bringing in people with different roles here. Maybe the the manager, maybe the HR professional. Um, I think you know where people work, the flexibility that they're given uh, is key. I, I found myself in the book obviously trying to avoid repetition of words, but flexibility was just kind of battering me in the face. I was kind of writing it so many times. Um, and I think that's key. You know, clearly people have very, very different uh, preferences in terms of, you know, where and how they, they like to work. And if we're ramming everybody into the same um, time frame or the same physical environment, I think we know that X percent of people are gonna say, well, that doesn't suit me. So I think that's one thing. And again, awareness of neurodiversity really does change that. We were working with a bank. That bank was refitting one of the floors in their big London office. And before working with us, they would have just gone and done it. And we said, why don't we survey everybody who's going to sit there, never mind neurodivergent, neurotypical, and say, you know, what are you concerned about? What kind of a space would you benefit from? And they adjusted accordingly. So that's the, the, the space part. And I think the manager piece is key uh, as well. We often find managers who are who are part of a sort of general culture training to start with, very, recognize very quickly that this is a, a leadership issue too. You know, how do I uh, give instructions in a way that benefits everybody? How do we come together and strategize as a team? Now that I know that people are going to do that differently, and they're not all going to do it the same way, that I do, you know, how do I give uh, clear feedback uh, and so on. And so for me, manager training and manager capability is key. Uh, I think there's no greater, uh, you know, path to organizational growth than management leveraging the talents of their teams in the most effective way. I don't believe you can do that if you're not paying attention to the fact that they think differently. So, you know, what we try to do is once we've made managers aware of the neurodiverse landscape that they are naturally in, giving them uh, a simple toolkit so that they can apply principles of universal design, but also that they can respond to and support specific individuals with their, of course, myriad, you know, unique needs. And though if you take person and context, you have this infinite variety of potential support needs. If we get managers prepared for that, you know, they don't just say, oh, you're dyslexic. Oh, well, I had a dyslexic employee last year and they love this tool, so I'll go and get it for you. But, you know, we can have a more informed conversation that lets the person, you know, really be in the driver's seat. So I think all of that is, is important as well. I'm glad we kind of build in those boxes as well as just kind of the general culture piece and the, and the hiring piece as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did have, I did have one question uh, as a, personally a question. Um, as a fellow British person, although we are all currently in the United States, I'll be in different time zones. You've worked kind of in the US and the UK. Um, and I have lived in the US and the UK and there are, different approaches towards neurodiversity and they're at different levels of understanding right just it's generally in different countries and different areas in the world and I know that I learned a lot more about neurodiversity and came into my own neurodiversity only after living in the states and meeting Kayvon and then working at the Frist Center and uh, so I don't really know what the kind of supports and, and um, programs are in the UK um, but Optimize obviously has more of a has more of an understanding of this um, do you think this is something that really is growing globally and could be something that, you know, works everywhere? I mean, to those two questions, yes. I, unquestionably growing uh, everywhere. And I um, get media requests from 
India, from New Zealand, I mean, you name it, people are talking about this topic, not surprising, because it's, you know, a human thing. And I think some of these big organizations as well, you know, we've worked with Google, and we did some work with Google in the Asia Pacific region. So, you know, that's an interesting case where you have the kind of corporate culture interacting with some of these local cultures. And, and I think sometimes that sort of also helps to, 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 to spread the message as well. So yeah, I, I think it's growing and I think it's global inevitably because you know it's a it's a human thing. One of the things we would like to do at Optimize is to do more work, more case studies with different types of organizations, uh, not just a Google or a Salesforce, but you know, I was asked the other day, I, I, I was interviewed and they said, who do you want to talk to? And I said, I want to talk to the general manager of a sports team uh, because I think we could give them a competitive advantage. You know, if you're in meetings all day in training camp and you're not thinking about the fact that everybody learns differently, well, you're wasting a lot of your time. So let's see what happens when we change that. Uh, the military as well, uh, same thing. And I think, I think that will all uh, perpetuate it. Um, just, I, don't, I wasn't sure if you were going to ask me about the, I know, the UK versus the US, but I think that's also interesting, actually, that uh, the US, I think, is great for getting things started. I think people are more entrepreneurial, more willing to just be the first and actually enjoy being the first. But I, I do think in Europe, uh, possibly there's a little bit more of a shared sort of wider sense of the importance of kind of equity and inclusion per se and therefore once a topic like this got some traction in the uk uh, it really you know grew quite quickly i think same thing with something like mental health i think what you see in the us is to some extent the best and the worst you see organizations that are incredibly uh, conscious of this stuff but you also see some organizations that are that are really lagging and, and to some extent who don't care that that others care about it uh, as much That's a that's a really interesting take on it because I, I I've been trying to figure out in my own head like how when people ask me what's the different approaches between the US and the UK to both mental health and neurodiversity I've never been able to put it into words but you're so right like in America it's very much I'm happy to be the first and happy to push those kind of push those things and then the UK has more of that kind of like oh that sounds interesting let's have a little cup of tea and talk about it yeah. um which very yeah. much speaks to the different kind of culture but that's interesting because both of those things are equally important and you're right i think europe does kind of lead a bit more in in accessing equity and inclusion and kind of understanding it broadly um like as a group you know like you yeah. said here sometimes you can get the the companies that are just this polar opposite and that's the same with universities as well right um I mean, look at look at yeah. the, I mean, the uk is you know, it, it's it, it's so much of the business community is in London. And, you know, once you start getting yeah. in London, uh, you really see, uh, you know, an advance. so many industries in the UK have their HQ in London. So anybody's doing anything. Yeah. There, you, know, you don't have that in the US as much. I think we thought when we started working with Microsoft, we just need to say that to folks and they'd be rushing to our door. Wasn't the case because someone says, well, that's, 3,000 miles from us and we're not Microsoft. So, you know, why should we care? Yeah, and I mean, even the differences in state to state, like I know here in Hawaii, we have um, some of the worst numbers in terms of recruitment and retention for neurodiverse folk, which is something I'd really like to kind of work on when I have the chance to do that. Um, and that's, there's many reasons for that. Um, but, you know, some states do better than others. And that's a hard thing to try and, to uh, kind of to cross those lines and to kind of deal with all the I mean every state is like a little country isn't it so it is yeah um well that's how we feel because our country fits into Texas like 12 times <laughs> yeah it is. but I think that is I do think that's important because you have probably you know less I don't know whether it's a, a national media thing but I think stuff is so localized and, and and a lot of this ultimately probably has to grow at a state by state base I think that's that's one of the things that um, you know the the Frist Center has made such a contribution for in Tennessee and and in and in the Nashville area, and I think that's something that's that's really powerful. And and those regions are are obviously lucky to to have it in a way that many other regions don't. Yeah, yeah, it would be it's a it's a shame in a way, isn't it, that you would have to kind of be in 
one place in order to access those things. Although the Frist Centre, we do do some great uh, student outreach programmes where students come from all over the country. So I, right. and, and again, you have national companies. And again, we work with a company like I've mentioned Salesforce. I think they do a great job on this. Um, and we have worked with and then featured them as speakers. And those are folks all over the world as well as all over the US. So it's not a it's not a perfectly siloed reality, but mm -hmm. it's um, it, it, it's complex. And of course, look, one of my hopes with the book was to uh, get this some of these messages and some of the things we've been talking about today to you know a broader audience than if you like to the phrase preaching to the choir you know the choir that already gets yeah. it and really cares about it and of course it was from the choir that I got many of my interviewees it's the choir that's propelled the book up the bestseller charts and I'm incredibly thankful of that but I really hope that it can do some impact by getting into the hands of somebody who is maybe a business leader who is facing some of those challenges that I described you know, innovation, keeping people around, making people happy and so on, who hasn't yet drawn the dots between that and neurodiversity and my book can help draw the dots and-, and Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're running out of time here, but I will make sure that for those who've attended today and for the YouTube, which I'm sure I've already had people emailing saying, oh, I can't make it, I'll watch on the YouTube. Um, I'll make sure that I put a link to Amazon. Um, is there anywhere else that, is it like local bookstore vibes or is it just Amazon or? It's Amazon, it's Barnes and Noble online. It's 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 online at the moment. Uh, it'll okay. be it'll be in some um, some other outlets, airports, and so on in 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 the fall. Uh, but probably you know th those those are those are the best place to to find it uh, right now. And I must say it's really a thrill for me having spent the last you know three years to some extent in a dark room writing this thing. To, to now have it out there and, and Jess you say that you read it and, and enjoyed it that's still great yeah I thought it was great um and you know and I appreciate <laughs> that yeah that's awesome <laughs> Kayvon's nodding I think Kayvon enjoyed it as well um, I have as as you are an author is it this is your first book it is yeah right okay so as an author I do have to ask you um unrelated to neurodiversity what is your favorite book fiction or otherwise <laughs> oh gosh that's that really um really putting me on the spot there um well i i i do i do love dickens i per se and uh being from a you know uh a, and same as you jess uh, uh a british family you know house is full of first and second editions so um so, so as not to, to overthink it, maybe we go with a um, maybe a tale of two cities. Good choice. That was great a story, answer. and uh, feel even better. <laughs> we've, got, we've got a sort of creaking version of it on the uh, on the bookshelf. Absolutely, the the correct answers are Dickens, Tolkien, or some other small <laughs> anything, anything British. <laughs> Anything British. Do you have any neurodiversity books other than your own that you think are helpful for those who um, kind of are trying to learn more? I, I, I do. And I, I'd love to talk about those, actually. And I, and I just wrote an article about that. And Jess, maybe you could even share that. Oh, that I will. I'll put it on because, the YouTube link. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of people ask me that that question. And um, I was actually forced in this article uh, to come up with five that I had found, you know, particularly um, valuable, inspiring. I was writing an article for Shepherd.com, which is a you know book discovery um, service, and 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 I came up with a few there. And I and I deliberately went. I mean, I I I went for one by Temple Grandin, so I didn't go too kind of underground, if you like. <laughs> and I thought I, I I personally think that that Temple Grandin's books are are still you know kind of a fascinating uh, starting point. Um, but I but I chose a couple of others that I think you know maybe people were, would be less uh, familiar with. I, I love explaining humans by uh, Dr. Camilla Pang. Um, I don't know if, if if you'd heard of that. That's it, it, it's a sort of you know popular science kind of book. Uh, the the the, the um, subtitle is what science can teach us about life, love, and relationships. But it's written by Dr. Pang, who is neurodivergent herself, and so 
neurodiversity and her neurodivergence just kind of infuses this fascinating book talking about kind of what we can learn from you know how cells work with each other versus like how humans work with each other right and like how cells work with each other is kind of perfect teamwork and how humans work with each other is like laughably bad teamwork when we kind of compare the two so <laughs> I really enjoyed that one and, and I really enjoyed um you know Dr Pang talking about her own um experiences um, and there was another as well that I wanted to mention quickly, which is called Autistic Community and the Neurodiversity Movement, Stories from the Front Lines. This is a series of essays and reminiscences by key figures in the early neurodiversity movement. Uh, I think their stories, when far fewer people were talking about this than today, right? And, and the, to some extent, the, the term hadn't even emerged, obviously emerged in, in the 90s. Um, a lot of people also ask me, why are we talking about this now? And I think, you know, the global neurodiversity, neurodiversity at work conversation of the 2020s uh, can really be traced directly to, to those pioneers, you know, that activism and, and their determination to, uh, to change things. And I, I really enjoyed those stories and, and, and shared some stories by some, some of those folks in the book as well. Thank you so much, Ed. And we are we are out of time, although I could talk to you all day. Mm -hmm. um, so, Kayvon, also thank you for jumping in and, and giving your expertise there. Um, I will put this webinar up on YouTube for anyone who couldn't make it today. And I will also leave, Ed, if you don't mind, I'll leave your contact information on there in case anyone wants to reach out. Um, everyone should go buy Ed's book. It is excellent. excellent Congrats book. again on the book, Ed, and thank you for it. It's a great yeah. contribution. Thank you. Thank you. And a pleasure to be here today. Awesome. So with that, I'll sign off and uh, kick, out, kick you all out. But thank you so much for our April webinar. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch soon, Ed, I'm sure, about a new partner, a new partnership or a new project, I'm sure. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate you uh, putting it all together. No worries. Thanks, guys.